So in Mark chapter 2, we're only going to look at a few verses, and we will begin in verse number 18. You there say amen. Kale, y'all, are you there? He is quicker than quick. Stand up with me in honor of reading God's Word. <clears throat> the disciples of John and of the Pharisees were fasting. Then they came and said to him, Why do the disciples of John and the Pharisees fast, but your disciples do not fast? Jesus said to them, Can the friends of the bridegroom fast while the bridegroom is with them? As long as they have the bridegroom with them, they cannot fast. But the days will come when the bridegroom will be taken away from them, and then they will fast in those days. No one sews a piece of unshrunk cloth on an old garment, or else the new piece pulls away from the old, old and the tear is made worse. No one puts new wine into old wineskins, or else the new wine bursts the wineskins, and the wine is spilled, and the wineskins are ruined. But new wine must be put into new wineskins. Let's pray. Now, Father, we have sung your praises. We have let our minds drift away from the world and let them be firmly planted in you and you alone. Your scripture has been read. Some godly women came to just thank you for all that you've done. And I thank you for the freshness of that. I thank you that uh, we always have your attention. I thank you that you're only a whisper away. I thank you that you know more about our situation than we do. And Lord, we can come broken. We can come weak. We can be worn out from this world, but we can be made brand new. Holy Spirit, would you blow on your people today? Would you uh, put a soft hand on our hearts? Would you uh, whisper a sweet word into our minds and our thoughts? And Lord, would you speak love over us today? We don't really care what the world thinks. We don't care. We care about the people. But Lord, this is a problematic world and there will always be problems until you come again or until you come fresh in someone's heart. So either way, Lord, let us put on our heaven suit today and worship you today as we will one day when we're in your presence. May your will will be done and only your will. In Jesus' name I pray. Amen. You may be seated. Can you throw me my water, please, sir? You don't trust your arm. In Mark chapter 2, in the last uh, verse that we looked at last week in verse number 17, he's speaking to those there, those, those Pharisees, really in the verse 17, some translation when talking about the Pharisees uses the word, ready? Scum. They came to look down upon the tax collectors and ones that they called sinners. But their attitude made them scum because they were not loving like God loves. They were not blessing like God wants to bless. And it was a flip. He said, I did not come for the righteous. Those are the self-righteous who think they've got everything good. They're good. They're great. They're wonderful. The, the ones that look down upon others. He said, I, don't, I didn't come for the righteous, but sinners to repentance. Now, in verse 18, when we come to that phrase there, that that paragraph, it is not exactly consecutive in time, but it's consecutive in thought. It's not the very next thing that happened to them chronologically. But Mark, when he was writing this down, by the inspiration of the Spirit, he was piecing these things together. It's kind of like one situation that was accented by the next situation that was brought into the light of the third situation. And in this particular case, there is even a fourth situation. So the second situation, there, it was a time where there was a festival going on. And during this festival, 
there were people doing religious things. So the people who loved God, because it was this time of this festival, <clears throat> they were fasting. Now, in the preference, excuse me, in the reference of their situation, they were fasting from food. And it was evident that they were. Many people were. Now, fasting is a very proper part of Scripture. It is a, a time when we uh, say no to something else so we can say yes to God. So we get rid of the distractions. And fasting will most definitely hone your thoughts in on God. When you get hunger pains and you turn that to looking to God in reminder, as a reminder, every time you feel hunger pains, every time you feel the weakness of it, you begin to look to God, then, then that kind of uh, accelerates your worship of God in that moment. And, and when you get the distractions out of the way, now the late Miss Margaret said, she said, oh, I can't pray in front of these people and all that. She, she can pray heaven down. I love to listen to her pray because I love her heart. When you can get the distractions out of the way, whether you're in your prayer closet at home, whether, whether you just are thinking about somebody and you're burdened by them, you can move all that stuff out of the way and we get into the presence of God, wonderful things happen. Encouragement happens. The Spirit has room to work. And it's a wonderful, wonderful thing. So they were doing religious things. They were fasting. But I want you to see their attitude. They're looking at Jesus and his disciples, and they are judging them. Sorry, I didn't get a drink. I picked it up to get a drink, didn't get a drink. My throat is getting, it's just, <clears throat> just something to walk through. When, when they were going through this, they were, they were doing the things of God at that moment, but the others were doing religious things, thinking that that was what was going to please God. You know, we've always said about Baptists, if we ever lost our order of worship, we wouldn't know how to worship. That's sad. That's sad. Because I don't have a, an order of worship on Monday through Saturday, do I? But everything I do during the week should be worship. I should take opportunities all the time to pray. I should take all the t opportunities I can have to praise. When I, I, I went and got gas this week, and I got gas for 248, so my, my heart was singing praises unto God that it wasn't 348. Amen? And somebody came by and they said, can I have some change? And I said, you know, I've gotten into this plastic world, and I paid with everything for plastic, and I don't have any change. And I hooked up my truck to get some gas in it, and, and, and I was walking into the gas. I, I, said, I said, come on. I'll get, she said, I just want a water. I said, well, come on. I'll get your water. So we're walking into the store, and I look down, and y'all know... If I find a penny, what do I do? I pick it up. If it's heads, I give him praise. If it's tails, I need to be humble. So I remind myself to be humble, and I, I, I try to get all those distractions out of the way. And I look down, and I didn't see a penny. Brother Rick, I saw a dime. That means I needed 10 times as much, right? That's the way I look at it. So it was, it was on tails. It was facing down. So I said, Lord... Some, I just got to fill up my, my truck, all 25 gallons of it. That hurts. And, and, and I got to fill it up, and I had money to do that. And, and I, I feel good, you know. And, and, and I walk in, so I'm going to buy this lady something. She doesn't have a, anything. And by the way, she got more than water, and I didn't care. I didn't care. And I thought, Lord, I need to be in your presence right now. And I need to be humble before you right now. If we could be instant in the moment, oh, what God could do. God could make a worship service at a QT station. Right? I can pay $70 and still praise God. It's crazy how much we need to do the instant in-season or out-of-season thing, but we think for us to be the right type of Christian, we've got to do it in a certain way. So John's disciples and the Pharisees are coming and saying, why aren't your disciples fasting like the rest of us? Why aren't they acting religious? This is what we all do during this festival. 
Look at Jesus' reply. Jesus said to them, Can the friends of the bridegroom fast while the bridegroom is with them? Folks, when you come to a wedding ceremony, that's supposed to be a happy thing. Well, it better be a happy thing. Listening to y'all, y'all didn't react to that. Maybe yours wasn't the happiest of things. I, I, I hope they were. I hope it was. We had a wedding here yesterday. Lisa and Eddie are on their way to Pigeon Forge. Now, I, I, I'll give you a secret. I married them in March. And, and they came to me and they said, we need to get this right. And I said, yes, you do. And I told them before I, I preached a sermon and they got under conviction. They said, we need to do this. And I said, yes, you do. So they came and there was, Mark, what, five, six of us in here? I don't remember, five or six of us. And, and I hitched them yesterday. I tied the knot. But, but they wanted to have, she had never had a wedding ceremony in the church. And she wanted to have a even though we did the one with five or six here. <clears throat> So we we did we had a wedding yesterday. I never had dancing in the middle of a wedding before. Anybody ever seen dancing? Well, we had dancing here yesterday. <clears throat> and Eddie, quiet Eddie Daniels, was dancing here. And and folks, when you're 70 years old and you're dancing, God bless you. Can I get an amen? Some of y'all get a cramp. And you get up and you get a cramp and you think you're dancing, you know? You're doing it. Um, and and, and it was, a, it was a, a time of celebration. And the choir sang for God so loved. And she asked me, she said, Preacher, I want you to give an invitation. I said, well, amen. It was a good time of celebration. They went downstairs and Mickey, oh, the cake. Bless your heart, my blood sugar went to places that it should never go. And I loved everybody. It was great. It was a time of celebration. Now, now you don't come to a time of celebration with a heart of mourning. You don't come to church when your eyes are supposed to be on God with your eyes on yourself. It needs to be a wonderful time of linking with God. He says to them here, he said, can, can the friends of the bridegroom fast while the bridegroom is with them? As long as they have the bridegroom with them, they cannot fast. But the day will come when the bridegroom will be taken away from them, and then they will fast in those days. You celebrate at a time of celebration. You cry when it's the time to cry. You encourage when it, when it needs to be encouraged. You fast when you need to be in that season of fast. But, but whatever those season it is, it needs to be, listen to me now, unto the Lord. This is Sunday, but for us Christians, we call it our Sabbath. It's not Saturday, but it's Sunday, the first day of the week. We Worship on, on this day because it is the day where the Lord was raised and we celebrate our risen Savior, okay? But understand this. We have the service here, but our hearts should be there. I went to um, my, my brother, Wade. His mother-in-law passed away. So uh, Lynn and I drove over to Dalton to uh, support the family, and um, <clears throat> it was in a Catholic church. Now, when I say the Catholic church, there's some things that's going to start going through your mind. And, and we like to kid the Catholics. You know, you go to a, a, a Catholic wedding or a Catholic funeral, and you're up and down, and up and down, and you kneel, and they read. And I thought that service was very respectful. I thought it was very reverential. I thought the priest had a, 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 a great attitude about him. Now, he must have bowed to the cross about six times in it. He had the, the, the robes on, you know. The, he was wearing the clergy clothes. And he was up there, and they, they had uh, different readings of Scripture. And, 
And I went in with an open mind, and uh, I found Jesus there. And I, I, I love how they love. But it was very liturgical. And Wade's mother-in-law grew up Catholic, and uh, they spent a lot of their time up in New Jersey. And they, she just, moved, she and her husband, her husband's still alive, uh, they moved down here to be close to Phyllis, my sister-in-law. And they'd only been down here a few months. And, and she was in her 90s. So um, they didn't really have an opportunity to go to uh, their mass. And dare say the priest didn't know them very well. And it's almost as if he could take uh, a funeral service and apply it to anybody's life. That person was in the casket. And I've been asked to do funerals for people that I didn't know. But it was very liturgical. It was very, you know, there was a time to stand, the time to kneel, a time to do have reading, have time to have that reading. He would actually go and sit down, and they would start part two, and he'd get back up again and bow again and all that. But that ritualistic, though you can see Jesus in it, that should not be how our lives are. I'm not throwing down on them. But our life should be in a genuine conversation with Jesus every day. We're supposed to pray without ceasing, right? We should always be in a, be in a moment of praise every day. And that scarcely happens. We should be as if we're going to the wedding, not just going around looking religious. Look what happens here. He moves out of that immediately into this. No one sews a piece of unshrunk cloth on an old garment. That's taking a piece of cloth that is brand new leather in that day, and the other is worn out, and you put it on. As that piece of cloth shrinks, it will tear and make it worse. Then he gives another illustration of that. He says, no one puts new wine into old wineskins. Now, if you've got an old wineskin, that word means one who is weathered and worn. And you put it, you better be tender with it, right? They didn't have distill distilling processes like we do today. They didn't have the big barrels and the big vats and all that kind of stuff. That's not what they would do. They would take it and they would put the new wine into a wine skin, right? Now, if you have an old, can we say, tender, uh, fragile, and you put new wine in it and it sits there for a little bit, what's going to happen with that, those grape juices, that wine? It's going to start to produce gases. It's going to start to ferment a little bit. And when that happens and it expands, what happens? It's going to burst. It's going to burst. And you've torn your wine skin and you've lost your wine. You do not put new wine into old wine skin. But these Pharisees and the disciples of John, they were trying to take the things of Christ and put it and mix it in with the things of their religion. You can't take grace and law and make them one. Grace always overrides the things of the law, the rituals of the law. If we have a church that is legally, legalistically clean, but we have lost our passion and the Spirit of God. We're nothing. We're nothing. Now, everyone knows that every church is different. Big churches may do service differently than little churches. City churches may do country, uh, services differently than country churches. You, you've got Church of God, and you've got Baptist. You've got Methodist. You got Presbyterians, you got non-denominational, you got Episcopals, you got all those things that are out there 
that will tell you that Jesus is Lord, but they all have their own way of doing it. And by the way, we got more different Baptists than anything. You, there's people who on their sign, on their church sign, says KJV. I'm not against the KJV. I read it my, uh, all the time I, when I was young. But what they're doing is they're telling everybody else, when you come here, you need to understand this is who we are. That's how we worship, right? I don't care if it's KJV or New, New King James or uh, NIV or, I mean, there's a whole slew of different Bibles with different versions, but there's only one God. So you come in and you say, hold on, and, and, and this is funny. I'm going to use it and I'm going to get in trouble. That little chair over there, we're doing remodeling. And that chair over there, some people have told me, oh no, we have to have pews. As if Jesus had pews. I mean, it's, it's, it's biblical, right? You have to have pews. And, and stained glass windows. God forbid that a Baptist church not has stained glass windows. Um, can I say I don't care? I don't care. Uh, the church I pastored for 12 years in Habersham County, we took out the walls, we blew them out, we went sideways, we doubled in space, and we put in pews. No big deal. No big deal. But can I also say, y'all like each other, but y'all don't like to sit close to each other. Now, just look around. How many people are, if there's a gap in here, it's usually in the middle. Now, Ed, you're kind of in the middle, but that's because you're sitting by Charles. Now, why is it that we like to sit in the corners? We just thought, we just do. Now, I heard something that was kind of amazing to me. They said, if you have more aisles, right, instead of one aisle, if we had it to where there was chairs and an aisle and chairs and an aisle and chairs, believe it or not, you can seat more people because one thing that in a Baptist church we don't like to do is this. Excuse me, can I get by you? Excuse me, let me get by you. Excuse me, we want to sit on the outside. Can I get an amen? Right? So literally, we can have more seating capacity with chairs than we can with pews. But we have to have pews. I don't care. And then we got this one, and the first thing I heard was, well, I don't like that color. And I said, well, nobody's decided a color yet. Um, and, and the cushion is like this. And some said, well, I have to have pews. I can't have chairs because they're more comfortable. That's why I said, well, I'll go get one. People can decide it. You know, sit in it. No, you don't have to worry about those things. Listen, if we get our eyes on what color the carpet is, on if our service is at 10 o'clock or at 11 o'clock, if we get our eyes on us, all we're going to have is us. If we put all this aside, because it really doesn't matter, I'm going to heaven. Now, some of y'all might get mad because there's no pews in heaven. I'm just kidding. I'm just kidding. As long as there's food, Charles, we're going to be all right. Amen? Why is it that even in the way that we act toward God, we can miss the spirit of things? You can't take something new and put it into something old. It doesn't fit. It doesn't fit. I never met my grandfather. He uh, was born in 1875. Not my great-grandfather. My grandfather was born in 1875. I guarantee you, if he saw me in church without a coat and tie, and God forbid that I rolled up my sleeves. Now, do y'all care if I roll up my sleeves? Well, okay because I'm going to wear them like this anyway. Right? I, if you wanted me to, I'd roll them back down. I don't care. I, I guarantee if my mama were here, she'd say, roll your sleeves down. She'd say, get your coat and put it on and find the tie. That's what my mama would say. That's what my grandfather would say. But that's not what Christ is looking for. 
If you won't, and, and by the way, God is always doing something new. Let me say this as I close. When a child is born, Grayson back there, he's only a, what, two months old, one month old? One? Really? He's going to learn quick. He will learn an entire language. He'll learn your looks and know what you want to do for him just by looking at you. He'll learn to sit up. He'll learn, oh, he's probably already learned to spit up. He'll learn to get up and walk. The rate of learning is the most when they're like, like that. And Jesus said, you must have come to him like a little child. Now, he'll get to the place where he'll learn to read and he'll learn to write and he'll learn what a bird looks like and he'll, he'll learn all those things that are out there at this unbelievable thing. And he'll go to school and he'll learn at such an, ex an exponential rate. Just amazing. And then he'll gather up a certain amount of knowledge and he'll know more than you. When he doesn't, won't have a clue. You look at him, Jonathan, bless your heart. I can't wait for the first time you look at him. And he says something and you think, you think, you act like you think you know more about this than I do. And that's exactly what Christians do. A new Christian will grow and they'll learn and they'll be excited and they'll be passionate. And then we get to this place where we know more. So we don't need to read the Bible anymore because we've already read it. We know more. We don't need to serve. I've already served. Oh, I'm more, I'm more worried about this than I am that. I'm not worried about anything except Christ and just being there for Him. I try to do. I try to get along with everybody. But it's hard in this world. And we're supposed to live with grace. Not Oh, you've got to change to be like us. So many churches are losing out because we're waiting for people to come in and act like us. We're supposed to be trying to disciple them to act like Jesus. And we're more worried about things that do not matter in heaven. Matter of fact, isn't it wonderful to listen to those ladies pray and we move out of heaven down here, or earth down here to move up into heaven down there, just to get a little bit of a parenthesis of a timeout or a breakaway. That's the Christian life that the Pharisees and, and the disciples of John, that they didn't understand. Can I, can I say this? The questions that the Pharisees and the scribes and, and, and even the disciples of John, they were all good questions. But they were questions because they were looking at the rituals other than our Savior. If you want to learn how to have victory in this world today, quit looking at the world and look at what God is doing in your heart, what God could do in this world today, and act on it. Act on that. Because that's what faith is. Is acting on the what God is leading you to do. We've talked about it enough. What we need to do is do it. Be fresh. There's a word here that for new, when he's talking about the wineskins, there's actually two words. One is new in the phrase of use, and the other is new in the phrase of time. We need to be used, but we need to always have the newness every day. We need to let our wineskins expand, but the Holy Spirit will not burst us. We don't have to have that old worn out thinking. We need to have fresh thinking. The best times in all of life are the times when the Holy Spirit comes in and takes over. I wonder, are you satisfied with your religion? Or are you still hungry for that fresh touch 
of God. They didn't realize there's a time for sorrow, but there's also a time for worship. Worship. He is worthy of our praise. Now, one of two things are going to happen. You're going to just say, good sermon, great time, enjoy the time, yeah, and go home and never let the Lord change your heart, right? Or you can let the tweak of the Holy Spirit say, am I fresh with you? Are my eyes on you or are my eyes on everything else? Let me be one with you, O oh God. And by the way, until you know Jesus Christ is your Savior and Lord, you're going to take your old wineskin to hell with you. Be very careful of that. 